now that I have your attention, let me tell you why America is not an exceptional country. According to a 2019 Time Magazine article, 44 million Americans have an outstanding student loan debt, and it totals to more than $1.5 trillion. $1.5 trillion. The amount of zeros that is, I mean, I can't even fathom what $1 million is, let alone a trillion dollars. But that's how much accumulated student debt we have. Um, And in my opinion, what causes uh, student loan debt to be that high is obviously the cost of college. And to me, tuition isn't even the worst part of the cost of college because you have to pay tuition. Uh, If you're living on campus, you have to pay for room and board. And then there's all these other unnecessary fees that get added to it. It could be a technology fee, a transportation fee, um, a landscaping fee, you know, for all those nice shrubs and grasses that they cut at your school. Um, It could be for something like a new gym. I know my alma mater, UConn, is definitely uh, has that fee added to the the bill. And so by the time, you know, your first year of college is finished, you're going at over 40 something thousand, heck, over 60 something thousand a year just to go to college. What like mm. and then after you graduate, you have a hard time finding a job in the field you majored in. I mean, you are not not only competing with people in your class here, you're competing with people that graduated before you, that are trying to get back into the workforce, that are coming from overseas. And as a recent grad, they don't pay you a livable wage. They pay you like under 30K, expecting you to work all these hours, do all these projects, all these tasks. And even then, they might not still hire you because they'll still put at the end of the little description box, one to five years of experience. How's a recent college grad who already did all that work in college because of what society told them that if you don't go to college, you have a less chance of getting a job or a decent job. You do all that work just to come out and not get a job and go into an oversaturated market. And even if you were hired for a job, you are getting paid a minimum wage or worse. And uh, you know how this past week actually that there was a hacking scam going on uh, for Bitcoin and all the verified Twitter accounts had to be put on hold because it was attacking them. And I saw a couple of tweets that of people who were just half joking and saying, hackers, really? You guys target things we don't care about. How come you're not hacking our student loans? I mean, erase that student loan debt. What are you doing? We don't care about you hacking Target or you hacking Walmart or even government secrets. We already know what they're doing. Why don't you hack our student debt away? We can't afford that. Please. <laughs> um, and it, but really, it, it is very bitter. And not even bittersweet. It's just plain bitter. I mean, look at this CNBC video clip. I want to be in debt for all of my life. Um, and the tuition here could definitely make that possible. People are horrified about the possibility of not landing a job, not landing an internship, because if you don't land on your feet coming right out of it, what do you do? It's one of the reasons why I cannot even enjoy being a student here, because every semester I have to worry about, do I have enough money to go to school next semester? Well, especially people who have to work. I mean, the workload here is enough. I have a job with it, actually the university in order to like supplement like my income. Nothing in life comes easy. I think everyone can attest to that. Get the best job possible to pay off that debt, and that's the best Jobs are just put on hold, or they've been completely cut off. Um, In fact, I'm going through that right now. But yeah, they're being put on hold, and a lot of students are worried, you know. They graduated with some of these plans in mind, or some of them have actually been offered jobs after they've graduated, but because of corona, it's been cut off. So now you're just like, okay, what am I going to do? But it's okay, you know, right? We're entering a recession. We're in a recession right now, so all all's good, 2020. Huh. Number two, why American exceptionalism is a myth, the insecurity of access to healthcare. 
So when I was at UConn, I had to take a film class. And one of the films we had to watch was a documentary called Sicko by Michael Moore. And it showed the beginning of what I knew about the healthcare system. So Moore, he focused on people who had health insurance, mostly through their job, and still faced problems in coverage and care. So much so that they were afraid to go to hospitals or go to the doctor because they knew they couldn't afford the debt that would come out of it. (laughs) Medical debt is one of the more common forms of debt on top of student loan debt and credit card debt. So it is tied, uh, most of people who have health insurance, they are getting the health insurance if they have a full-time job and that full-time job offers benefits. One thing I noticed though about Michael Moore's film, while I thought it was very poignant, very good at exposing the outright greed and um, coldness of the healthcare system in America, it didn't even talk about how million there are millions of other Americans who work part-time jobs or who are really poor and don't have access to healthcare at all. They don't have health insurance. And they are afraid of getting sick themselves and or seeking help at like a public um, health facility because at the end of the day, the bill will come to them and it's like $1,000 and they can't pay. Um, and for those who don't have health insurance tied to their, their job, um, they might go through the Affordable Health Care Act or the health care marketplace um, around Obama's, started up during Obama's administration or they might go through their state um, health care system. For example, from New Jersey, New Jersey has uh, their state health insurance called NJ Fam Care. And how NJ Fam Care determines how you can get health insurance for you and your family by your age, um, obviously by the number of people in your family, if there are dependents in your family, um, and if you have a disability or not, which I believe is also the federal way as well. But New Jersey also uh, does this thing where they break it down by your income. So how many people are in your household plus what is your income per household? And the sad part of it is, because I actually know a relative of mine who I helped to try and get health insurance this way since their job was not full-time. Um, we sat down with a NJ Fam Care worker and basically, we ended up leaving that place, and my relatives still did not get health insurance. Um, age was fine. She was, the relative was eligible. Um, and the only thing that the relative wasn't eligible for was income. Just $1 over or under the income bracket for whatever number of people are in your household and everything can put you at a disadvantage, and you still won't get health care. And then with the Affordable Health Care Act, while I think it was a good attempt by the Obama administration to try and get health care, it failed in a lot of ways. Um, it definitely needs to be reformed and completely like redone. But I do think that that was a good first step. But obviously, you know, the Republicans, they've said they've wanted to repeal and replace it for years. And they had a chance now, but it's still there. They have not replaced it or made anything better. But that's on a different topic. But what I'm trying to say is that even with for the Affordable Health Care Act, again, I helped a relative with this. Um, recently, uh, this past year, Obama had actually tweeted about how you could get, um, you could pay for health insurance through the healthcare.gov marketplace for $10 or less. And I mean, that's exciting. You see that like, oh, what? Like that's cheap, what, $10 or less to pay for healthcare? But when you actually do the uh, calculations, when you go on the marketplace, you realize that no, um, you your income may be below 30K and you put that on there. And yeah, you might pay zero per se a month for the health insurance, but the health insurance that they're offering you covers next to nothing. And they don't talk or they don't advertise about the out-of-pocket costs you would have to pay for whatever procedure or whatever visit you're doing. So you're still stuck. 
um, how is that okay? <laughs> I mean, we live in a country where people are afraid to go to the doctor, afraid to get treatment, afraid to get help because they know that when they leave the hospital or the doctor's office, they are walking away with thousands and thousands of dollars in debt. Number three, why American exceptionalism is a myth. Unpacking systemic racism is so exhausting. If there's one thing this pandemic has taught us is that racism never stops. Even as we're battling a disease, racists still made time to harass, intimidate, and kill black people. In fact, in 2010, when the Black Lives Matter movement was started, after hearing killings of Sandra Bland, Trayvon Martin, Alton Sterling, the list goes on and on, there were a lot of other movements as well to subvert the message of what it means to say Black Lives Matter. So you had the All Lives Matter folks coming in saying, well, not, not black people aren't the only ones that should be, be talking about their lives. What about all lives? And they had people who were supporting police brutality, the Blue Lives Matter folks. Well, Blue Lives Matter too. Like, what the heck does that mean, okay? When a police officer takes off their uniform, they are whatever race they are, white, black, Asian, whatever, Hispanic, and they are who they are when they take off the uniform. They're a regular person. So no human beings are not blue. There's no such thing as blue lives matter. And the all lives matter folks, how can you say all lives matter when you clearly see that all lives really don't matter? One marginalized group is being brutalized and tortured and discriminated and just outright treated as second-class citizens in their own country. That's Their life isn't mattering, you know? And let's say your own people also got hurt too. Would you not protest for them and say that their life matters? So yeah, all lives matter? Hmm. But um, I also want to talk about James Baldwin, who is a brilliant orator, poet, author. And I think his his expressions about what it means to be black in America, about what white America is, about that the the very nature of America and how sadistic and cruel and mastermind it is that it I mean you, you just have to watch this clip a deal of it but then I was behind the last day. yes so you heard only some of it did you hear anything that you disagreed with or I disagreed you... with a great deal of it and uh, of course it's a good deal I agree with but I think uh, he's overlooking one very important matter, I think. Each one of us, I think, is terribly alone. He lives his own individual life. He has all kinds of obstacles in the way of religion or color or size or shape or lack of ability, and the problem is to become a man. Well, what I was discussing was not that problem, really. I was discussing the difficulties, the obstacles, the very, the very real danger of death thrown up by the society when a Negro, when a black man attempts to become a man. All this emphasis upon black man and white does emphasize something which is here, but it emphasizes it or perhaps exaggerates it, and therefore makes us for, uh, put people together in groups which they ought not to be in. I have more in common with a, a black scholar than I have with a white man who is against scholarship. And you have more in common with a white author than you have with someone who's against all literature. So why must we always concentrate on color or on religion or this? There are other ways of connecting men. I'll tell you this. When I left this country in 1948, I left this country for one reason only, one reason. I didn't care where I went. I might have gone to Hong Kong. I might have gone to Timbuktu. I ended up in Paris on the streets of Paris with $40 in my pocket on the theory that nothing worse could happen to me there than it already happened to me here. You talk about making it as a writer by yourself, you had to be able then to turn off all the antenna with which you live because once you turn your back on this society, you may die. You may die. And it's very hard to be a typewriter and concentrate on that if you're afraid of the world around you. The years I lived in Paris did one thing for me. They released me from that particular social terror, which was not the paranoia of my own mind, but a real social danger visible in the face of every cop, every boss, Everybody, 
I don't know what most white people in this country feel, but I can only include what they feel from the state of their institutions. I don't know if white Christians hate Negroes or not, but I know that we have a Christian church which is white and a Christian church which is, which is black. I know as Malcolm X once put it, it's the most segregated hour in American life is high noon on Sunday. That says a great deal for me about a Christian nation. It means that I can't afford to trust most white Christians and certainly cannot trust the Christian church. I don't know whether the labor unions and their bosses really hate me. That doesn't matter, but I know I'm not in their unions. I don't know if the real estate lobby is anything against black right? people, but I know the real estate lobbies keep me in the ghetto. I don't know if the Board of Education hates black people, but I know the textbooks that give my children to read and the schools that we have to go to. Now, this is the evidence. You want me to make an act of faith, risking myself, my wife, my woman, my sister, my children, on some idealism which you assure me exists in America, which I have never seen. And how I interpreted that was, imagine you, you are born into this country. And because of your skin, because of certain physical traits, you are designated as black by sight. You didn't choose to be called black. That was what the system and society for generations has always placed you as. And as soon as you are labeled that word, all the burdens of that word come with it. And there's not much you can do about it because the system and the way it was designed was created so that your own kind fails. And to be of that group and know that your people are hated and despised and discriminated for whatever reasons that are put up there, it's, it's the burden of trying to navigate the world and still be a functioning human being at the same time. Um, for anyone who's black in this country, for anyone who's indigenous in this country, for anyone who's an undocumented immigrant in this country, um, we under they understand. Um, so I found I found that very interesting, um, and I actually have a little bit of example of that, of trying to unpack systemic racism and explain it. Uh, when I was ex an exchange student in Germany, I had a classmate of mine, a German classmate of mine. And he, you know, saw whatever mass shooting or whatever police brutality killing was going on in America at the time, I don't remember. And he had asked me, he said, hey, Tama, can you explain systemic racism in America? And I looked at him, took a deep breath and said, I cannot. Um, if I were to have a, a discussion about this, it would take, just to get to even the, the basic <laughs> explanations of systemic racism it would take like a whole maybe the whole four years the whole four years of of classes and even then it wouldn't be enough I said well I could only tell you my experiences but you'd have to do a lot of reading on your own like papers essays books watch videos you know talk if you know any black people around you or if you do come across another black person don't overburden them with questions but ask them listen to them when they tell you their experiences. But yeah, I mean, it's America's institutional racism is so complex, so uh so deep that it is It's not the overt racism that is difficult to unpack. It's the covert racism because it is so unless you are the group that is being marginalized you no one else can see it clearly um unless you really pay attention because it's everything from redlining you know what community you live in the funding that goes into your schools um the way you are treated at hospitals um the company you work for i mean look at the diversity of most corporate industries. For example, I saw a uh, something about how in the media, the sports media industry, it's very male, very white male dominated, not that many women, and there's a few people of color that are sports writers, sports broadcasters, right? 
But who are the people mostly playing the sports? If you're talking about the top three biggest sports in America, yeah, we're talking basketball, it's mostly black athletes. We're talking football, mostly black athletes. We're talking baseball, well, this is a bit different actually. Baseball is still very white and mostly white managers, but football, mostly white owners. Basketball, mostly white owners. How is that diverse? <laughs> that is a clear divide um, in in the industry. So I think James Baldwin like definitely expressed a a real um he definitely explained a real problem of racism in this country everything from the bad the ugly to the sinister so again how can a country who says they're exceptional be okay with this but i am really proud of the protests i am seeing this these i've been seeing these past couple of months because i think it's showing that there are a lot of people that do care, not just black people, that want to see this country progress. So that's that's been really nice to see. So last but not least, number four, U.S. politics. Everything is polite corruption. And what do I mean by polite corruption? For example, we call bribery in America, lobbying. Lobbying and bribery are the same thing in this country. Lobbyists are mostly from big corporate organizations that donate millions, maybe even billions of dollars to political campaigns and effectively influencing representation uh, in government. A lot of the politicians who we elect take America is quite hypocritical when they report on other countries with high levels of corruption, like Nigeria or Venezuela or many countries in Asia. Um, they always like to, you know, go to those countries and say, well, see, they're so corrupt. And yeah, there's corruption in those countries, but at least they're open about it. You guys pretend as if you are not corrupt, as if there aren't big donors donating to your campaign and uh, pressuring you or you willingly working with them to subvert any type of progress in the country. Is that also not corruption? Hmm. Can't, can't be uh, throwing stones when, when there's a, there's a fire in your own house. Um, so the first time I actually learned about Amer- the America's political system in a more complex way was my freshman comparative politics class. And that's where I learned about the two party system that we have here in America and basically the whole winner take all approach with it that one candidate for one um spot and only one person can win and there's a lot of losers and oftentimes we the citizens are the losers because let's say we wanted this candidate but because they didn't have enough for the overall um vote they don't get it so you are left Picking someone who might have a chance of winning, but doesn't necessarily align with your views. And so the two-party system forces everyone to pretty much fall in line and pick a side. I mean, look at where we are right now. In fact, uh, Hassan Minaj's Patriot Act did an episode on the U.S. election system and pretty much highlighted all of that about how we think we have a plurality election, but really we have a winner-take-all type of election but you gotta believe me winner take all encourages republican extremism and then our electoral system rewards it that system gives way more power to white republicans in rural states and way less power to democrats clustered in cities more people voted for democrats in six of the last seven presidential elections two of the last three Senate elections, and the last House election. But Republicans control the presidency, the Senate, the Supreme Court, most state legislatures, most governorships, and 100% of late-stage Kanye. Uh.
We don't have majority rule in this country. We have extreme minority rule. That's why none of this feels normal. I know you guys are like, I'm fucking normal. Politics is not normal. And Trump is the epitome of what winner take all does to Republicans. He loves going on the attack. He's super far right and he never got a majority, but he still won. Winner take all affects Democrats the opposite way. They need way more votes to overcome those geographic disadvantages. Dems aren't playing to 12 straight up. They're playing to 12 and you gotta win by 10. So they picked a candidate who is undeniable. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women created by the go, you know the, you know the thing. Now, I mean, look at what we've produced in our upcoming November election, which is probably gonna be one of the most contentious elections we've had in the past like decade or so. Um, and not just at the presidential level, at the congressional level, at the state level, at the local level. I mean, it's it's not going to be a fun year for election time. Woo. But yeah, um, so Asam Minhaj like touches on that. And so I think we can learn a little bit from our par the parliamentary systems. The Those systems are in countries like Canada, uh, a lot of European countries, a lot of African countries. And they have multiple parties. And I know there's a, a poll out, and even just talking to some friends, that most Americans would like a third party. And no, I'm not talking about the Libertarian Party, because they're lumped in with the Republicans. Um, I believe the only, like, major party that is even maybe somewhat recognized in the U.S. is the Green Party. But they get nothing, because most Americans know that if you want your, some, you know, any a semblance, a fraction of your beliefs or your views to get into the um the the legislation or the seats or whatever um you have to pick someone who has a chance of winning and that's still usually democrat or republican but i know a lot of americans who are probably in the center or left or right or non the extreme parts would like to have established political parties that actually align with their views but I've also seen that parliamentary systems, though, they aren't completely perfect. For example, Canada has multiple parties, but it's still between the conservatives and the liberals. And their conservatives and liberals aren't completely like what our conservatives or liberals are here. Um, the UK has a parliamentary system. There's a lot of different parties, but it's usually always down to the Tories and the Labors. So Nigeria, another example. Um, they have multiple parties. I want to say over like like 50. I'm probably even being nice. But it's still a battle between the PDP and APC parties. So no election is or election system is completely perfect. But you got to admit like America's it's it's exceptional in in the way it plays about it. We have gerrymandering over here. We have um lobbying bribery we have lobbying over here we have our two-party system we have um hmm, uh, anyway we we have a lot going on um and going back to the lobbying problem I and mean, we saw citizens united they it was a supreme court case that won five to four in favor of citizens united and it was basically said the president that you can pretty much donate as much money as you want to political campaigns, and it's not a problem. But it's a problem. How is that okay? You basically set a legal precedent that it is okay for campaigns to be financed with hella money. How is that clean? How is that a fair system? How is that a fair vote? Interesting. Now, with all these problems that I listed that America has, how can we come out into the world and come out to our citizens and say that we are a progressive country? We are the most powerful country in the world. We are a beacon of democracy. How is a country that has the number one prison population that treats its minority 
population as second and third class citizens. I'm talking about the black people in this country, uh, undocumented immigrants, the indigenous peoples of this country. Um, How can a country uh, who calls itself progressive say that health care is not a human right and we're not going to make any concrete steps to give our citizens a safe, uh, uh, well-thought-out, well-planned, well-covered type of health insurance? How can a so-called progressive country build its foundation on evil, basically, on slavery, on racism, on imperialism, and continue to build on those same ideals and then still come out to the world and to its citizens and say that they are a progressive country? How can a country who makes it a political debate for basic common sense things that should not be a political debate, like, oh, hmm, let's see, a uh, coronavirus, debating whether or not masks should be worn as an attack on civil liberties, or a country that debates whether or not assault rifles should be banned, even though there are multiple mass shootings a year, huh? Haha, <laughs> I mean, the list goes on and on. We say we are an exceptional country. We are, and America's an exceptional country. But what are we exceptional on? We're an exceptional on lying to our citizens and lying to the world. We are exceptional at believing that we are exceptional when really we have no concrete proof of being exceptional. Now, I say all these things because it frustrates me and angers me and upsets me that America is like this. But at the same time, I try and have hope and belief, especially when I've been seeing these protests going on, that people want more for our country. We want more for our country. We want us to actually put into practice that we are a progressive country. And that's not going to get done. None of this is going to happen if we continue to move in the direction we're going, which is pretty much been linear. Um... So these are a smidge of my of my reasons why. If you guys have any other reasons of why you think the American dream and why American exceptionalism is a myth and or you want to talk more about this with me, I'll be glad to to have that conversation. You can hit me up in the comments below. Uh be sure to like this video and subscribe and thank you for watching. Bye-bye.